Hey everyone, I'm Stephanie, and I believe that all readers should read children's literature, especially adults. So that's what we do on the Kid Lit Love podcast. We celebrate all things children's literature, picture books, early readers, middle grade, and young adult novels too. Whether you're an adult reading to your inner child or connecting the young readers in your lives with fantastic books, you've come to the right place. Each week, we'll talk to a different children's literature author and discuss their books, their hopes and dreams for readers, their writing process, and much, much more. So grab a notebook to build your TBR and let's get to today's episode of Kid Lit Love. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Kid Lit Love podcast. I'm Stephanie and I'm here today with middle grade author Ellie Swartz. She's the author of multiple books that I have loved that I know many teachers and students have loved like Finding Perfect, Smart Cookie, Give and Take, Dear Student, Stand By Me, and the book that we are going to talk about in more depth today, her newest one, released on Halloween of 2023, Hidden Truths. Ellie, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to chat with you today. Thank you, Stephanie, so much for having me on. I'm super excited to talk books with you this morning. Ah. I can't wait to dive in. I kind of gave you the the heads up a little bit before we recorded. Um, the very first book I found of yours was the book I think that is still closest to, to my heart so far, at least, um, is Finding Perfect. And ever since I read that, it was the book I wish I had as a child. So it really spoke to the inner child that I still have <laughs> in my adult body. <laughs> um, and so I'm just so excited to talk not only about your books, but about children's literature and what your books offer for kids in terms of just helping them figure out life and who they are and what's going on and what they they could be, which I think is the, the big gift that I always seem to find inside of your books. So why don't you jump in? Let's give us a, give us a little overview of who you are, where you are, kind of your backstory on how you came to write all of these beautiful books. First of all, thank you so much. Um, those are it's the greatest compliment to get from as a writer is to know that your books are touching hearts of your readers, young and old. The, the, whether you're 12 or 20 or 50 or 80, I feel like the books I write all have themes of um, that we are braver than we think and that sometimes we believe and my books all have characters that have mental health challenges or are neurodiverse and I really as I write it's so important to me that kids and readers feel seen and heard and honored and respected and so to know that Molly's journey in Finding Perfect about a girl with undiagnosed OCD connected with you, it just is incredibly meaningful to me because that really is what I hope all books do, right? Find their readers, touch their hearts, impact their lives and their journeys. So for me, as I said, my books um, have characters that have mental health challenges and are neurodiverse. Uh, I didn't come to writing right out of the gate. I am a lawyer. I taught um legal research and writing for a period of time. I write law books or I did write law books for like 20 years with my father-in-law. I started a business, a college prep business. And all the while I was writing, it took 15 years for my first book, which was Finding Perfect. It was the first book that was published, Stephanie, but actually it was the fifth book I wrote, ironically. <laughs> and uh, Hidden Truths, which is my newest book that just flew into the world. That story was the first book I wrote. I wrote it the summer of 2001, and it just took 22 years to find its way into the world. So I'm really excited about the path that I'm on. I feel incredibly privileged to write for kids. And I find that in 
when I visit schools, when I talk to readers like you were sharing, I'm so honored to be on the receiving end of their truths. The things that they share with me, that they trust me with their confidences, um, it's really an honored space to be in. Yeah, I, you know, I think as a reader, and you've likely found this as well, when you read a book and you do feel seen, you feel validated or you feel, you know, whatever the moment is that you feel like you've connected with the character or something going on in the text, you, I instantly feel this kinship that the author doesn't know about, but I certainly feel like, oh, oh yeah, that's Ellie's book. I know, I know that. I know her, right? Because you feel so closely connected to the characters in the book that it becomes this relationship. You know, I, I I joke with a lot of the kids that I meet. My family is so used to this as well, but I will talk about the characters in the books I met, you know, as if they're real, like, well, so-and-so said this and so-and-so said that. Um, it's just something that enriches our lives so much, especially, I think, when the books are focused, as you said, on mental health and real things that kids could be experiencing. I mean, I think that when I travel around, I talk to kids and I share with them or ask them, like, why didn't you tell anybody what was happening? You know, whether it's a mental health challenge or their brain is functioning differently than they see their classmates brain functioning. They're processing the world differently. And I ask them, like, why didn't you say anything to anybody? And the responses I get have been, well, I don't want kids to stop hanging out with me. I don't want people to think I'm weird. I'm embarrassed. So I mean, like, that's not okay with me. It's not okay with me that kids feel shame or embarrassment about something that is common, something that is a challenge, just like any other challenge. And if I can write stories with characters that help break down these stigmas and stereotypes that let readers know that they are seen, that their experiences are valid and honored, and that they're not alone. So many kids feel like if, especially in the social media world that they're living in, this shiny penny version of life, that they don't fit and that their experiences are, are, so different from what others are talking about, they feel like there's something wrong with them, that they're broken and they're not. And I honestly, I can't write fast enough to have as many characters and as many friends, as you've said, in the books so that kids know that they're not alone. Like that is my, what drives me is having kids know that they're honored and that they're imperfect and they're beautiful and that all of the challenges that they are facing are, are okay. Like that we all are working on something and it doesn't define you. Right. It doesn't define you and you're not alone, even though you might think you are at a, a particular point. So in your, I'm curious because in your introduction, you talked about how you first were a lawyer and you were writing law books and now you're doing this amazing powerful work in middle grade readers. What, how did you get there? How did you make that jump? Was it something you always thought of, kept in the back of your mind, or was it just a, you know what? I think it's time to do this. I, you know, it seems like such a big jump, but I think, first of all, I've always loved reading. I've always loved writing. I wasn't very good at it, but I really loved it. I loved it because it made me feel all the feels. So, and, you know, legal work is all about story. They're just somebody's real life story and helping kids with their college essays was also about story, helping them find their voice. So the through line isn't as different as it appears. It's always been a, for me about story and connecting on a real human, real emotional level with the people that are impacted by these stories. So, but there was a catalyst. Uh, my son, who's now 31, was in um, fourth, I think it was fourth grade. And he was assigned the book, Mick Hart Was Here by Barbara Park, a great read. 
and we read it out loud together. I highly recommend the power of a read aloud. And we, or I laughed and I cried and I felt all the feels reading this book. And I turned to my family literally when we finished reading that book and said, oh my gosh, this is what I want to do. I want to write books for kids that make them feel all the feels. That summer, I wrote the first draft of Hidden Truths, which was called A Promise Between Friends at that time. And just 22 years later, that book has flown into the air. So it the path was winding and long. But in retrospect, I was exactly where I needed to be at the stage in time. I was I, at each stage in time. So I'm grateful that I'm here, but I learned a lot along the way. I love that. I love that. You're right. I wouldn't, you know, obviously I asked the question because I wasn't quite seeing that through line. Like <laughs> it's a lawyer with lawyer, you know, manuals go to middle grade, but you're right. I can see the threads of the story throughout. And I love that kind of, lightning bolt moment and that thankfully you followed it and you explored it <laughs> well, I think, you know uh, there was 15 years of rejection which is what I open every school visit with yeah. I don't want anyone to think that you can if you're not good at something today that you can't be good at something later that you can't grow to be skilled at what you love I wasn't a good writer. I was, it was something that I loved. And I, over 15 years, got hundreds of rejections. Statistically, nobody would have thought I would be published, let alone have five books out and another one on the way. Like it, <laughs> that 2001 writer who got hundreds of rejections over the course of five books but it took the my family's belief in me and my belief in myself to keep going. And just, I realized along the way that I loved writing more than I hated rejection because it's not like I got better at being rejected. Like it's right? not like, you know, I'm, I'm older. So it's okay when people say your writing isn't good enough or you're not good enough. Like I never feels good. So you just have to find, and what I share with kids is I just don't want them to find what they love more than rejection, more than, you know, it's like not making the team. I mean, you're still a soccer player because you play soccer, even if you didn't make the team. I was a writer because I wrote, even if I wasn't published. Mm -hmm. And sort of having that belief in yourself and having others believe in you can really help you get over that finish line. Yeah. And that belief, you can see it in your books, that belief that in yourself that you had to keep going in the publishing, you can see in the kids that, that you write about. So I'm, I'm, I feel privileged to be able to make that connection and talk about that, that backstory with you. Well, thank you. I, you know, so Hidden Truths came out on Halloween mm -hmm. and I'm very honored to say it was picked by The Week Junior as their November book club book of the month. And in the write-up they did, they said, the week junior said that my books are about characters that defy expectations. And that, I mean, it just makes my heart so happy because I feel I didn't set out on a course or a path to make sure all of my characters do that. But in retrospect, they do. They all defy expectations they, of themselves and whether it's expectations the world has put on them or expectations that they have put on themselves. And that makes me very proud because I think, as you said, <laughs> being published sort of defied the expectations of the 15 years of no. Yeah. And I did love reading that in the back of Hidden Truths of yeah. how you know, how long it took for the story to come to life, how, it, how different it was, you know, as you, you talked about it in relation to the ages of your kids and what their goals were. And I thought that was just, that was wonderful. I, I loved reading about that, um, which is a kind of a good entry point to jump into talking about the book a little bit more. I loved, I, I kept reading it and thinking, who do I adore more, Eric or Danny? And I couldn't figure out 
who, um, but both of them are in this book and told in the alternating kind of chapter framework um, with the really cool icons that, you know, help readers shift those gears, whether it's the baseball or the, or the crossword puzzle. Um, and this was just a, a beautiful book about so many things that I think a reader could walk away with it. I, I loved the themes of friendship, changing friendships, changing expectations of yourselves, kind of finding yourself on the inside, um, and a little bit of that social media that you mentioned too, which definitely impacts how all of those things roll out in real life. I would love for you to, to give us a, an introduction, a, a quick overview for those that haven't read it yet, like me, of Hidden Truths. First of all, thank you. I love this book. I have lived with this book for 22 years. I have lived with these characters. As you had said earlier in this interview, these characters are like friends. I mean, if I'm doing it right, all of my books, those characters feel real. I've certainly spent a very long time with Eric and Danny. This book is about changing friendships. It's about the promises we make to keep those forever friends, the lies we tell, the secrets we keep, and the healing power of forgiveness. I mean, Danny and Eric are best friends, neighbors. They bond over comic books and donuts. I mean, who doesn't love comic books? Oh, I know. The donuts and, are the best part. I was getting so hungry. <laughs> right. I feel like the book should come with a warning. May make you want to eat donuts. Yes. <laughs> and I... You know, Danny is that rock star girl that we all have known. She knows exactly what she wants and she is going for it. She wants to be on the all boys baseball team and she is determined to get there. Talk about defying expectations. You know, she has heard her entire life, blah, blah, blah. I'm a girl. You're good for a girl, but you're not good enough for the team. The truth is she's a great baseball player, period. No qualifier. Yeah. Eric, unlike Danny, really doesn't know what he wants, but and he's okay with that. He's lovable. He loves crosswords. He does love comic books. Uh, he's creative. He's imaginative. He's a problem solver. He's also super forgetful, has ADHD, is okay with who he is in the world until the summer happens and they go on their annual camping trip and there's an accident and he worries that it is his fault. And that is basically where the story kind of opens and you follow both Danny and Eric as they confront their the wedge that is now in their friendship and their shifting friendships and how they both go towards other friends, make other friends and how all of this impacts their relationship and what has anchored their relationship for so many years. You know, this is about forever friends, you know, loving them, fighting for them, forgiving them. I hope readers love it as much as I do. I feel like there are a lot of entry points. I think Pernell Rip wrote this wonderful review that I was so honored by. And what I loved is that she shared, there are so many entry points for different readers, different ways that they can connect, whether it's somebody defying the stereotypes or expectations of, uh, of, of you as either uh, somebody wanting to, like Danny, achieve something that has she's been told she can't do or Eric defying expectations that he's more than just being forgetful. He's more than his ADHD. That's not who he is in the world or the ideas of the impact of social media or the impact of bullying has on who you are or being an upstander and what that means yeah. or the aspect of as Eric ultimately fights for justice and kind of takes on a cause because he feels it is the right thing to do. There are, or baseball or comics. I mean, I yeah. felt like I was very honored by that review and what you had shared, because I do feel like there's, this book is for every reader. And I feel like 
lots of different readers for many reasons can see themselves on the page. I completely agree. Um, I'm going to add one in a second <laughs> that I don't think you've mentioned. <laughs> um, but you're right. There are so many things, whether it's ADHD, um, the recovery process of an accident or, or, or someone in pain, getting hurt, their social media, bullying, doing the right thing. There's also, you know, the thing that really jumped out at me was that I really felt like I had an inner window into how both of the characters felt on the inside, which didn't always match their actions on the outside. And that happens all the time, right? In the real world of what we're thinking and feeling versus what we show people we're thinking and feeling, what we're grappling with, like really big thoughts that we're either afraid to say um, or just, you know, begging a higher power to help, you know, to just help make everything okay because of what the characters are carrying. And I, I felt like I truly knew who these characters were at the at the end of the story. I love that. I love that you felt that you know what they what they experienced emotionally and privately wasn't always what they shared on the outside or to each other. And I was hopeful as I wrote this cuz Stephanie one of the things I realized along those 22 years this was originally only written in Eric's point of view. And so when I added Danny, what I realized was that this was her story too. And we needed to see both sides of the story. My reader's worlds are very black and white. You're either a friend or you're not. You're good or you're bad. I think there's a lot of gray. Like we live in a lot of gray space that, yeah. that I think is important to understand that you know, who you are on social media or who you are when you're sitting in the cafeteria is not necessarily who you are. There's a, always, there needs to be room for that. There are things that are happening internally that you may not see, whether it's mental health challenges, neurodiverse, or just emotionally, you're going through something. And I'm hopeful that my readers, because maybe they aren't team Danny or team Eric, like you said, they can see why is Danny acting this way? Why is Eric acting this way? They can have a window into what is happening in their heart and then why their actions are the way they are. Yeah. And as you said, Eric, you know, Eric talks to God, you know, he's, it's not religious. It's more in those moments in life where you feel out of control. You feel that things are bigger than you and you don't have the power to control the outcome. He reaches to God and just talks to God and is negotiating, you know, I'll clean my room if Danny's okay. I'll be nice to my sister because, because he's 12. Yeah. And that's what a 12 year old, that's, that's their their lens. Yeah. And because of that, because I got to glimpse the inner workings of, of each character, I think another entry point into this book that we haven't mentioned because we haven't mentioned this audience yet, this podcast is all about sharing children's literature, not just for kids, but because I truly think adults can benefit just as much from reading kid lit. And I, as I was reading this and navigating kind of what each of the characters were feeling, I couldn't help but read this as a parent. Because there are so many moments where I thought, huh, I'm in my notebook trying to make sense of things and wondering maybe, well, what's my daughter thinking sitting over there? Oh gosh, I guess I could have reached out and grab somebody's hand, but I, I didn't because I was overwhelmed, right? I couldn't help because I am a parent kind of read it from that view and think you really never know. You really never know. Like the title's brilliant. It's hidden truths. Right. <laughs> we never, never know. And so I think reading it as a parent, it just made me stop and think like, what, what might my own kids be thinking or feeling that they aren't putting out there as well? And, and, and how do you how can I 
better make some connections around that. So I, you know, it, it spoke to my inner child, but boy, was my parenting heart wide awake. <laughs> I love that. I love that so much. And it's really meaningful to me. I mean, I'm a parent, so I think part of that lens comes from who I am as a parent, or I hope I am as a parent. Right. <laughs> and I, you know, empathy, right? That's what it's about for all of us. Everyone gets busy and lives get, you know, are filled with whether it's work stress or life stress, but really having the kindness and grace and patience for yourself and for your children or others. Um, I think, I hope is a takeaway from this book. And I was recently on a school visit and I was with like, 600 kids. And before I went in to meet all the kids, which was amazing, I met the principal and the principal of the school said to me, I read this book and I feel very uh, different. It made me see kids who have ADHD and who are struggling at times. It made me see them differently and react differently based on reading your story. And that, you know, I mean, that's the greatest compliment is what you said, what she said, that you take a book and you learn and grow and discover from it, whether you're 12, 20, 40, 50, whatever, that you, there's always those moments that you can connect and, and learn. I mean, as a writer and as a reader, yeah. And, you know, you started off saying, you know, the, a, a real gift of a book, especially your books, you hope that kids feel seen or readers feel seen. And I think the flip side of that gift that is equally important that you just kind of talked about is not just to be seen, but to see also to, to get that completely other side that just makes you stop and think, okay, maybe my perspective isn't the only one. Maybe this thing this person said wasn't because of this, but it's because of that. And and this book especially just helps us, helped me kind of just get out of my own head for a minute and really and really think about that. So I think your books do both. They yes, readers feel seen, but they also they help us see something differently, which just makes us all better humans, right? In the in the whole process. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. That's yeah, that really warms my uh, author heart. Uh, thank you. And I do, I, I hope that is the takeaway. I want, you know, I want everyone to just take a beat when they hear something or see someone, you know, doing something or saying something that they may have a negative reaction to and just consider but there might be something else going on yeah. and just give that person grace and kindness and, you know, just take a deep breath and, and then allow that person the space to maybe, maybe they'll share with you what's happening yeah. inside. And if we all did that, we could just save the world. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. This is us. We're on a mission now, Stephanie, together. Right. That's right. You know? I'm, I'm in. <laughs> right. Kindness matters. Well, even though I want listeners to go out and grab hidden truths, you did say something about working on, on book number six. So do, are we allowed any sneak, sneak peeks yeah. or previews? Yes. Yeah. So first of all, I should, it was called stand by me. You had said that in the beginning. It is, we have, the name has been changed to same page and this book I am incredibly proud of. It is about Take Charge Bess Stein, who unites a group of her friends and a group of rock star librarians called the Book Warriors to fight a book ban that is happening in her middle school. Yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, I love this book. I love Bess. The moment she came into my head, her sense of justice and determination and just 
empowerment was so, it just wove into my heart. My hands could not stop writing. And it was, uh, she, she was too powerful to ignore. And I love this story. Um, it is, I feel relevant, obviously in the world in which we are currently living in. Fortunately. I, I think it does do a very good job of seeing all different aspects of this, um, this issue. Uh, my goal was to really at this time in, in our world, allow a story about a kid and kid agency and empowerment and what this may feel like and has felt like to a number of young readers. And this, you know, it begins with her platform of becoming president of sixth grade by promising a book vending machine and a new panini maker and no homework Wednesdays and she wins and they get a book vending machine. And I use the book vending machine was really important to me because visually a young reader could see what was happening without an adult telling them. So she could visually see that books were being removed. And in that way, it started her journey and her sense of agency and justice. And I love that about her. And I love Bess. And there's a lot of um, different friends in this group and in this book. And the group of librarians are amazing. And just as they are in real life, fighting what I think is a really important battle for our kids and their right to read. Yeah. Oh, I cannot wait to get my hands on this one. You're right. Unfortunately, it's a book that is timely, uh, that is very needed. Um, and if there is a book about book banning that also has a book vending machines and panini makers, then <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm all in for that yeah. one. That sounds wonderful. And for Thank people you. like us who love books, it's not only a story, but it's going right to that that bookish heart of, oh, the whole issue, you know, so many books touch so many people in so many different ways. And we need them all. We need them all. We need them all. We need them all so kids can decide what they want to read and discover. This goes back to what we talked about in the beginning. They can discover who they are. They can recognize that they're not alone and have a, that relationship with the book is very different than anything else. It's very personal. It's private. It really allows you to process what you're reading, to have those characters feel like friends and to maybe see yourself or somebody else in a very different light. And that is the gift of a book. And I feel like, I hope that gift continues to stay with all of us for our young readers. I just think it is so important that they're all seen and their experiences, their histories, their lives are respected and seen and valued. Well, your books are all of those gifts. Well, I'm grateful. I'm grateful they're here. I'm grateful that you came on to chat with, with me about them. Can you let everybody know where they can find you? whether it's website, social media, where are the places? Pretty much all of it. I am. I have a website, elliesworts.com. Um, a lot of information. There is an educator tab. Um, for It's for educators and resources. All of my books have curriculum guides that I have uh, created with educators to say thank you to teachers using my books in their classroom. I know their lives are busy. So this is material that they can use if it is useful to them. I am on Twitter, I am on Instagram, I'm on Facebook. And as far as getting my books anywhere, books are sold, um, you can get it, you can ask for it. Obviously, you know, go to your local indie if you can. And if you want signed copies, um, Eight Cousins in Falmouth or Wellesley Books in Wellesley, Massachusetts are the places where nearest my home. So 
those are the places that I'm happy to, you know, if you put in an order, I'm happy to send a signed book plate or a signed book out to you. Oh, wonderful. That is very good to know. And for, for listeners who don't know what handle should they look for on social media? Cause I do have to say if they aren't following you on social media, they need to, because your feed, there's always one word that comes to mind when I get to scroll your posts and it's effervescent. You are the happiest author I've ever met. And I haven't met right virtually, but <laughs> you cannot scroll your feed Ali and not just be like all, all sorts of lit up with, with you around those books. So if they aren't following you, they need to. So how, how can they find you on social? Well, first of all, thank you. Um, <laughs> You're welcome. I have a lot to be happy about. I love my job. I love my life. I mean, I feel very lucky to do what I love and to love what I do. So yes, you can find me. I am at on Twitter. I'm at Ellie Swartz at Ellie Swartz. And on Instagram, I'm at Ellie Swartz Books. Also on threads, I'm at Ellie Swartz Books. There are too many now platforms, but and on Facebook, I'm just Ellie Swartz. Okay. So usually I'll, if you search my name, um, you pretty much land in the right place. Yeah. And if you go to your website, you have links to all of them there. As I well. have links. And also I love school visits. I travel around the country visiting schools. If you're an educator and you're interested, reach out. I love talking to kids virtually in person. It is my happy space. So um, I'd love to connect. Yeah. Literally the sign behind you is your happy place. Yes. <laughs> Not that listeners can see it, but I bet they can feel it. <laughs> thank you. Oh, well, thank you so very much for coming on today. I loved this conversation. I loved the book. I loved the other books. And now I can't wait to uh, get my hands on the same page. So thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for having me. I really appreciate it. And I loved our conversation. Me too. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. And I'll see you inside the next episode. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Kid Lit Love podcast. You'll find links to all the books, resources, and ideas mentioned in the show notes at alitlife.com. And if you want more, you might like to listen to my other podcast called Get Literate. It's a podcast that explores all things books and reading, notebooks and writing, and everything in between to build a life you love. One more thing. If you love what you listen to today, please take a moment to rate and review the podcast or take a screenshot of the episode and text it to a bookish friend. This helps the podcast grow and builds our bookish community of kid lit love. Thanks for listening.